Okay. And today, continue our discussions on uh, late 19th century America. Talk about some of the uh, inventors and business magnates and trends of the time period. Look at Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, John D. Rockefeller, uh, creation of uh, urbanization, and called Tammany Hall Machine Politics, the Pendleton Act. Look at disfranchisement. Uh, Okay, not disenfranchised, but disfranchised. Uh, the Jim Crow laws, what can be called the Solid South, and the Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson. Any questions on that? Here's a quote by Thomas Edison, who is a master of uh, invention and uh, self-promotion. He once said about... Uh, one of the projects that I haven't failed. I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. <laughs> and sometimes it is just a matter of persistence. So many things in life. Actually, in spite of the problems America's facing uh, by many people on the farms, of uh, working man and so forth, uh, it's also a time of great innovation in the country. I'd say Thomas Edison really became the court symbol of that. Um, Thomas Edison, as a child, was kicked out of school for being what they called completely unteachable. It turned out he was dyslexic and just couldn't read very, just couldn't read very well. But his mother, like so many mothers, believed in his uh, abilities and thought she was going to teach him herself. And Thomas Edison became one of the most celebrated, most successful inventors of uh, the late 19th and early 20th century. It's called the Wizard of Menlo Park from his little uh, laboratory, Menlo Park, New Jersey. Came, uh, he's responsible for over a thousand patents. Edison invented such products as the incandescent light bulb. Here in the room, this fluorescent light bulb is a variation of the thing, but the light bulb basically that was Thomas Edison. The biggest problem he had at first was trying to find the right filament to uh, uh, illuminate uh, the bulb. Most of his more than 1,000 patents had to deal with uh, electrical generation and uh, transmission of electricity. And so with the light bulb, people basically made electricity practical for many people. Put the switch, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, the room is lit. So they're having to light candles, having to work on uh, these natural gas lamps, which were very dangerous and could cause a lot of uh, uh, cause a lot of fires. And so basically, you're just you know, without the light bulb, you're carrying open flame around the room. But his inventions weren't just limited to uh, the light bulb. Uh, also, been in something called the kinetoscope. Motion picture camera. Now, cameras have been around for decades by this point, but. Uh, People are starting to notice if you took a bunch of pictures of something really quickly and kind of flipped through, it looks like they were in motion. Well, Edison realized that and it developed basically a, a device that took a lot of pictures very quickly and put it on film. So playing it back makes it look like someone's actually in motion. Essentially, movies. Actually, his studio produced a lot of uh, early films. Sometimes it was just simply somebody standing there uh, while they're talking, or some were creating scenes from a, a play or a sketch. Uh, Access up notes the movies that Edison produced were basically very what we'll called a short subjects, maybe ten or fifteen minutes at most. But he also invented the phonograph record.
He learned how to record sound. So it's a very crude device. Basically, as originally, it, was a, it wasn't a flat disc, it was a cylinder. Uh, basically, a piece of aluminum foil he uh, talked into the speaker that uh, basically recorded the vibration to the sound on uh, this uh, aluminum foil uh, cylinder and he could play it back. I immediately saw the use for it. Uh, they're recording uh, music, recording uh, speeches by important figures of the day. Uh, and probably his favorite idea was uh, uh, books for the deaf. I mean, books for the blind, that is, they're called uh, talking books, audio books. But uh, sound quality is very poor for so today, but it was the first time people actually had to record uh, human sound. So the first uh, uh, thing ever recorded was uh, Edison reciting a nursery line. Mary had a little lamb. Now, interesting enough, the kinetoscope, these are all silent. They didn't, they didn't know how to record sound on the film yet. So Edison tried to uh, combine the process, basically recording the sound and uh, taking the uh, image recording the image at the same time and playing them back, but uh, it fell out of sync. And you've seen those Japanese movies, the bad dubbing, where the lips don't line up the sound. Basically, that was the effect. So, uh, playing the phonograph while uh, watching a kinetoscope movie uh, fell out of favor pretty quickly. But uh, what happened, though, was people liked watching these movies, and uh, for long we had theaters all over the country. What happened is that they just hired somebody basically to play music while the uh, show was going on. But uh, he had a pretty good little industry on the side. This is in addition to his elect work electricity and uh, electrical products with uh, just uh, filming movies and uh, recording uh, uh, music. But uh, his, one of his biggest efforts, though, was to try to bring electricity to people's homes. And uh, with that, create a whole separate company, Consolidated Edison Company. Essentially, in some of the biggest cities in uh, the Northeast, uh, the Consolidated Edison Company is still the main power company. New York, Detroit, uh, a few other areas. Power company is energy. It's Con Ed. And what he's using, though, is a system that came actually came up something of a, a controversy in the uh, electrical industry. He used direct current electricity. Let's see. Now, direct current, it's a very safe system. Uh, the problem is, though, it's hard to transmit across large distances. It's the same type of electricity you find in batteries. But it meant with direct current, one thing Edison was terrified by the possibility of people being electrocuted. So, uh, this being a safer system, he uh, insisted on that, but it meant power stations every few blocks or so. Freddie got into a uh, real debate with uh, one of the employees of his lab, man named Nikola Tesla. Tesla was an immigrant, a brilliant scientist in his own right. His uh, dream was of uh, coming to America and working for Edison. They got to do that, but uh, Tesla got into an argument with uh, Edison over the use of direct current versus uh, Tesla's preferred system, alternating current. Alternating current is actually the system we use today. 
The thing about alternating current is it can be transmitted over much larger distances. You don't need these uh, power stations every few blocks. It would have been just uh, very difficult to uh, produce and maintain. But of course, alternating current is a much more dangerous system. Uh, this system can be electrocuted on. Well, Edison and Tesla get in this huge argument. Tesla eventually quits and goes to work for a man named George Westinghouse. Westinghouse is a working electrical, developing electrical system itself, and uh, adapted uh, Tesla's system, uh, calling it the Tesla polyphase system, which ended up being much more successful uh, commercially. So Westinghouse is still a huge uh, producer of electrical components, all sorts of other products today. Well, in the middle of all this uh, argument between the two, uh, Edison ended up inventing the electric chair as a means for execution just to show people just how dangerous uh, alternating current was. But what it ended up doing was kind of uh, repelling some people because, yes, it did kill uh, uh, convicted criminals, but uh, sometimes it missed. You ever see that, that old movie, uh, you know, The Green Mile, where they uh, are electrocuting the guy and they don't do it quite right? Well, it's, it's just a little, a little, a little, uh, dude. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kill the love. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't get the fun flat. Yeah, exactly. exactly. If it's not performed just right, well, it can burst into flames or it's a long, excruciating process. And well, guess what happened with Edison's electric chair? They messed up. The horrible, excruciating death of uh, the press is uh, watching very carefully. But a lot of state notice, oh, well, the guy is dead. Uh, so they start using the electric chair as a means of execution, but... Uh, they repelled people from Edison and so started moving more towards the uh, uh, Westinghouse and Tesla. Tesla also believed that electricity could be transmitted wirelessly. Uh, envisioned these huge towers that would just uh, blast electricity across the air and people would just uh, tune into like a radio to draw the power. But uh, that system didn't catch on pretty much. Actually, enough today, Tesla. It's a uh, his last name has actually uh, been used as a, a scientific unit. It's a unit of magnetic intensity. Tesla. But anyway, Edison and his problems. He ended up switching to alternating current himself. And a bunch of investors really interested in the possibilities of the different inventions. Um, the belief is that, uh, well, yeah, I have the light bulb. That's good for uh, use for electricity, but uh, all sorts of other things you can use, too, that run off electricity, all sorts of other products the home. So, for, so they got, some investors got together in this other company they called Edison General Electric. But Edison had a falling out with investors, so dropped out of the company. It simply became General Electric, GE. The GE products you have that come from the company started by Thomas Edison. Actually, eventually the phonograph record went from being a uh, metal cylinder to a flat uh, um, a disc. Gradually, sound quality got better. Interestingly enough, the invention of the radio almost destroyed the recording industry in the early 1920s because a lot of people paid a bunch of money for a record and you can listen to your favorite song on the radio for free. Next thing, it took a long time for the recording industry to adapt to be able to uh, be profitable while radio still existed. Same problem the uh, 
recording industry is having today. Why well, pay a bunch of money for a bunch of really bad songs on an album with only one you really want to listen to or listen to it on the radio or download it off the computer? So that's the story of Edison, Tesla and Westinghouse. I also have another figure along here, Alexander Graham Bell. He's a Scottish immigrant, um, actually comes to Canada and then to the United States, claim to fame, telephone. Invented in 1876. His wife was deaf and uh, he was determined to try to invent some way of helping make her hear, but along the way kind of gets sidetracked and ends up the telephone instead. Interestingly enough, all the money he made off the telephone, he ended up converting to a foundation to help the telephone. But basically, the premise is very simple. Basically, you speak into a receiver. That receiver breaks down the uh, impulse, the sound impulse of your voice into electrical pulses, which sends over wires to the receiver, which basically descrambles it back, sounding back into a recognizable sound. I'd say reasonably successful at the first try. They, uh, not long after its invention, they uh, took it to the White House uh, to demonstrate it to President Rutherford B. Hayes. Hayes was, thought it was an interesting device, but couldn't understand who would actually use a telephone. It seemed so unfamiliar to they didn't know to use a telephone. Why would they suddenly start using it? That's what a lot of people thought at first. Mark Twain thought they're up the only knew three people would actually could ever use one. His banker, his banker, his lawyer, and his publisher. But otherwise, who would use a telephone? You want to talk to somebody? Go to their house and talk to them. Go to their office and talk to them. You need to send a message? Write a letter. Get a delivery uh, boy to uh, send it over. Send a telegram. Why would you actually pick up a phone and talk to them? Because see, it was such a change way people did things or were used to doing things that People didn't step back initially and think about the possibilities of how you actually use it, what you would actually use a telephone for. It's extravagant. It's just unnecessary. And people started changing their mind pretty quickly. And it's like in the 1980s asking people, well, who would ever use the Internet? Who's actually going to try to hook in a modem and try to get one computer to talk to another? What's the use of that? Ten years later, you can't live without the Internet. Well, by the turn of the century, most cities had telephone service. Actually, eliminated the need for costly messengers or businesses, allowing families to spend um, families and friends to us uh, uh, kind of erase the distance by calling each other on the phone and be a little closer again. But interestingly enough, when phones were first invented, uh, to get a number, you didn't have the direct dial system. Basically, you had to call the operator, tell them who you wanted to talk to. Actually, you didn't have that. Just uh, click the receiver, <laughs> operator come on, then you want to talk to. When the first uh, phone numbers came out, might be only one or two digits, six or twelve or twenty-one. In fact, go to uh, downtown, go uh, on the side of Elm Street Bakery. You'll notice this kind of fading out sign to the pharmacy was there. It says, El Rader Pharmacy, phone 21. Two digit dialing. But as more people got uh, telephones, the numbers expanded. In fact, each city, uh, major neighborhoods, and uh, larger cities, they end up having their own telephone prefix. And that's why in El Rado, every phone number starts with 86. So that's originally the prefix for the uh, substation phones in El Dorado. Same reason why you have those uh, on telephones, you have all those uh, letters with it. A6UN, Union. After a call to college, you uh, uh, tell the operator you want uh, Union 28131. Or you just simply dial it in. Of course, you're out. 
you're within the prefix and substation system, you just have to dial four or five digits. So up into the 1960s, uh, 1970s even, in some areas, you didn't need to dial seven digits. But uh, every phone in Union County, or uh, El Dorado specifically, eight six Union. I know it's on the Simpsons, sometimes they're giving out phone numbers, it's Klondike, whatever, KL55. It's because uh, kids watching the show would, uh, wouldn't understand that. They don't know what number to dial or you can get down the phone. Yeah. So not yet. If you want to dial outside a long distance, you'd have to call the operator. Now, say I want to call Boston, Massachusetts. Here's the number. Uh, and they dialed in and send it, send you over. Of course, there are a couple different ways you can have a phone system. You can have, uh, have the operator direct dial directly, or what they call the station to station call. Which basically, all calls being processed in one main trunk line. You'd have basically have to wait your turn to uh, get the call to come through. But uh, area codes would have started coming out for the 1960s, 1970s, before that to call the operator to get the call. It's call. An explosion of uh, cell phones. Uh, everybody has a phone. Everyone has one at home, too. So they have twice as many numbers as possible. But, uh, a lot of people are first lines in many communities, especially in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, they were called the party line. Basically, you'd be sharing a phone number with about four or five different uh, households. I mean, to pick up a phone, you actually listen to somebody's conversation. Yeah, my mom pulled up. Well, your mom needs to listen on yours. <laughs> uh, but this was the invention of the telephone. And I'd say today, pick up a cell phone, you can carry it anywhere with you. You can carry a, um, you can call anyone anywhere in the world instantly. Direct dial and uh, direct dial. Eventually enough, the uh, before this it was all rotary dial phone, then like the night then a push button phone was come out to the nineteen sixties. The cordless phones, they don't come available to the 1980s. And then it's a bad problem that uh, the big bulky things uh, had to carry around. Uh, uh, they could sometimes uh, zero in on someone else's wireless signal, so they'd be listening to somebody else's phone conversation at the same time. Range was limited. But a uh, wireless phone today, as long as you're within a uh, a reasonable distance of your receiver. You don't need a big bulky antenna. Uh, and uh, the cell phone, long period in uh, some range of a transmission tower, still works. Let's talk to John, about John Rockefeller for a minute. Today, the name Rockefeller is synonymous with a lot of money. Family billionaires, and it's because of this guy right here, John D. Rockefeller. After making his first big fortunes in the Civil War, uh, but uh, the start of an oil refining company in Cleveland, Ohio, to start trying to eliminate his competition. After selling his competitors, special contracts, favorite customers, and uh, outright buyouts. For a long, Rockefeller's uh, oil company becomes one of the biggest uh, in the country. Push for efficiency in all areas of his operations, trying to see what's the, what can you do something for the least amount of money. And he once said he wasn't so much proud of the fortune he made, but of the fortune he saved. By 1870, he formed Standard Oil Company. And by 1890, he controlled 90% of the nation's access to refined oil. Basically, he had a monopoly on it. You wanted oil, you had to do business with John Rockefeller. And he set the prices and the terms. 
That says oil production, refining, distribution, all areas of operation. Uh, back little town in uh, Washtenaw County, Standard Umstead, it was founded as a company town by uh, Standard Oil, basically, to score for oil drinking. For Rockefeller's business activities led to the development of trusts. See, one way to form a monopoly through a trust. So let's show you how that works. Uh, bring that in here. And if your corporation, it's more than just a company. It's a uh, Corporation, you're selling shares of ownership that is stock to individual shareholders. These guys are your shareholders. Stock going to him. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if the company makes a lot of money, uh, that said, they'll actually give money to a stockholder, so they call a, a dividend. But uh, basically, these guys own shares of ownership in a company. Trust is a little different. That's like one step removed. You've got Corporation A, Corporation B, Corporation C, Corporation D, all in one industry. And so what they do is, they consolidate their operations into a large trust. And then, they sell shares of ownership of the trust. And the trust is controlled by a board of men, that's almost always exclusively men, uh, We set the terms of uh, how a uh, basically of how a, an industry is run. Set prices, distribution, uh, pay scale, everything else. Basically, they run all aspects of those different corporations. But essentially, those corporations become subsidiaries of the trust. In 1889, New Jersey changed its corporate charter laws uh, and allowed corporations to buy up other companies. So the creation of the trust led this rapid consolidation in American industry. Before long, there are trusts for everything, every kind of consumer commodity you can imagine. Oil, sugar, uh, railroads, banks, insurance companies. Uh, you name it, there was a trust for it. Sugar trusts, steel trusts. And so this ends up leading to the creation of the monopoly. Basically, ownership of a, a commodity is, con or, uh, is controlled by one person or one group of people. You get ten percent. Got some oil producers about making about ten percent of the oil industry here, but. They don't have very much pull, and they're difficult to get a hold of. Now, what this means is the country has to go to one person or one group for some commodity that's vital for the economy. Suppose the country has to go to war and it needs oil. They have to go to John D. Rockefeller, and he set the terms for the safety of the entire country. Company sets its own prices, working conditions, any way it wants. And so, because of this, the wealthy end up becoming even wealthier. Because a rock star, they had to invent a new word to describe how much wealth he had. Billionaire. That's it. Probably happened one day, but right now, the richest man in the world is Bill Gates. Had like, net worth like ninety billion dollars. Can't feel bad for him. Mm -hmm. 
What ends up happening because of this uh, consolidation is about 1,900, 1% of the nation's corporations controlled 33% of the manufacturing. So access to raw materials, distribution, manufacturing capabilities, controlled by a very, very small group of people, very small group of corporations. Basically, it's one group calling all the shots. Now, farmers and workers saw trust in corporations as a threat to the Republican ideal of a society where wealth and power are equally distributed. A lot of middle class critics uh, pointed to the corruption that emerged within companies and government because of their activities. Basically, you had trusts and uh, not, uh, corporations going in basically openly bribing politicians to change their policies one way or another to favor the corporation. But a capitalist argued it was a survival of the fittest or what's called rugged individuals of the practice this way. They just get the idea of what's called social Darwinism. So what it is is they warp the ideas of Charles Darwin. Darwin, uh, several decades before this, produced a theory of evolution um, after his observations of the natural world that said that uh, essentially um, species evolved over many successive generations through natural selection, selective breeding. That is, some trait allows uh, members of a species to be able to survive and produce the next generation, and therefore those descendants have those traits of those survivors. So we suppose that a uh, predator comes into the environment and uh, uh, only those that were fast enough to escape this new predator or by colored plumage to uh, blend into the environment better, those are the only ones that survive and produce the next generation. Therefore, their, their descendants had those characteristics, natural selection. Except Darwin really caused the He said uh, human beings evolved as well. It wouldn't like the idea that humanity was not... Uh, fixed permit that uh, people they really are just animals tempered by 10,000 years of civilization. But what started happening, though, was people started warping these ideas of natural selection and surviving because you are the best fit for the environment to a lot of people, particularly the wealthy, saying that they're wealthy because they're the fittest. One critic once said, being born on third base, then you hit a triple. That uh, since they are wealthy and, the, and the, therefore the fittest, therefore they are justified in doing whatever they want to uh, maintain their wealth and power in society. That basically you are poor because you are a bad person, because you're not fit, because there's some kind of defect in you. And unfortunately, that's an idea that's permeated a lot of the American imagination today. We have people working uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week and still can't get by. It's not because of lack of work ethic. It's because they just can't get paid very well. Like most uh, people on food stamps today are working. Their salaries just don't make them enough to help sustain themselves. The social Darwinism said basically... To all these people who are not wealthy, cut them loose. Don't give them charity. Don't give them any concern. Either they uh, fix themselves and survive, or they should just crawl up and die. The slums, don't do anything for them. Let them destroy themselves. Let them, uh, don't give them any concern. Survival of the fittest. That if you give charity to someone, you're spoiling You're a bad person if you're poor. You're good if you're rich. And so, this attitude, this social Darwinism, uh, imbued many in the country this sink or swim attitude that rejected charity regulations on the workplace. It is somehow the idea that the free market is going to fix everything. That if there's something wrong with uh, how companies run, then 
people are going to vote with their pocketbook. The question, 90% of the refined oil, you need oil. How are you going to vote your pocketbook when all you have are monopolies? And the very uh, problem that whole idea that the free market fixes everything is just simply not the reality. Question. Would the free market have ended slavery? No. Why? You get too many people trying to make money off of it. A lot of people were making money off of it. Somebody had to step in and say, this is wrong, this has to stop. But child labor stopped on its own for the free market. No. Too many people make too much money off of it. Child labor still exists today. So many other examples. Prostitution. Is the free market going to stop prostitution? No. The sad fact is more than half of all prostitutes in the profession now are being held against their will. Basically, modern day slavery. Somebody has to step in and say, this has to stop, this is wrong. That's why our societies have laws. That's why we don't run by social Darwinism. Social Darwinism says, I'm trying to apply biological principle to human morals. There's a difference between right and wrong. Money is not make something right. Money and morality are two separate concepts. Social Darwinism makes a saying, there are no rules. Money is the only only morality. As I say in a later movie, greed is good. But morality is how our society operates. It's the idea that we can't, society cannot function if we constantly hurt each other. I reach the point that people are no longer productive or can no longer participate in society. Now, this is an era we have the idea of the rags to riches, uh, people going from nothing to coming uh, fabulously uh, wealthy and thanks. It's the idea in the United States of upward mobility. Now, you do have some cases where people go from nothing to becoming uh, millionaires. It happens at this time period. Andrew Carnegie is an example of uh, Thomas Edison, a star of very humble means, uh, among others. But For a guy like Andrew Carnegie, you have, you have hundreds of others who are uh, worked just as hard and just didn't get the breaks. This upper mobility can't happen, but it's uh, going from nothing to uh, the top of the uh, top of the economic food chain. It's very, very difficult. It does not happen very often. Can you move from lower class to middle class? Yes, it happens all the time. Can you move from middle class to upper class? Sometimes. But most of these people we're talking about here really were the exception. Most of the upper class are born into the upper class. There is upward mobility in American history still today, but it's more limited than what some people would suggest. Turn of the century, a lot of that uh, upward mobility is being limited by this fact right here. Very uh, select few wealthy are controlling all the wealth. Back in 1900, 1% of uh, U.S. families controlled 88% of the wealth. The other 99% are chasing that last 12%. Now, that's going to be a problem in a country where you have an economy based on consumer spending. I suppose you're all multi-millionaire. A nice thought. But, um, if 
You're a multi-millionaire. How many refrigerators are you going to buy? How many do you need? How many cars do you need? How much clothing do you need? <laughs> okay, she says a lot. <laughs> but still, it's going to be limited. Versus you say have 30 people, 30 families, all their aggregate wealth all together adds up to one multimillionaire, they still have to buy 30 refrigerators. They have to buy 30 cars, 30 sets of clothing for themselves and their families. As you have to produce a lot more for people with a lot less. And so therefore, to keep that company going, they have to aim towards middle classes. Because this 1% here, it's only so much they can buy. Not as much they want to buy. But everybody else, they still have to buy. They still have to live. There's a lot more of them. There's a problem if they don't have the means to buy your product. So, in the beginning of the 20th century, this is still a serious issue. You the idea, such as long-term implications, this was a permanent overclass in the United States controlling the nation's economy, wealth, and politics. The idea that democracy could be bought and paid for, that your one vote just didn't count so much anymore. Now, there were, had been some gains by the uh, working class in the United States. Uh, by 1900, you had the eight-hour workday for all federal employees, uh, passed by Congress in 1868. Uh, state laws protecting safety and hours, uh, but actually, and uh, wages were gradually rising, but not in comparison to the very wealthy. In fact, most workers had less political power in 1900 than they did in 1860 simply because these millionaires could buy an election, or after the election, buy a congressman. They call it a donation. Actually, I put it to you in this way about uh, politics. Who's a pol Take the average politician. No name, no political labels or anything. Just take the average politician. Who's he more likely to listen to? Some guy who raised a million dollars for him, or some Joe Blow on the street who might or might not have voted? The wealthy. How about the growth of cities? Urbanization. The city, much like the fact, became a symbol for the new America in the years from 1870 to 1900. When historians describe the American city didn't so much evolve as it exploded. Cities are going from just empty spots on the prairie to being just these huge, bustling metropolises within a few years. But uh, Americans are slowly moving to town. 1790, 90% of Americans lived in the countryside. Only 10% of the cities are urban. By 1860, 16%, about one every six Americans lived in the city. Cities are growing, but not very much. But for urbanization, suddenly that doubles. 33% by 1900. By 1920, 50% of all Americans live in the cities. America, by 1920, was an urban nation. People living in the city, most Americans living in the cities, not living out in the countryside. In fact, today, most Americans don't just live in a large city, they live in a suburb. Almost the opposite of what it had been in 1790, almost 90% of Americans live in the city.
But American cities are growing rapidly because of industry, because of of a bonds of the farms, because of immigration. Let's throw out some numbers for you here. Handing out the number compiled by the Census Bureau, uh, growth of cities from Let's say Boston, Massachusetts goes from a city of 250,000 in 1870 to 448,000 in 1890, nearly doubled in 20 years. 1920, nearly 750,000, nearly tripling in 50 years. New York City. Going from being a city of 942,000 in 1870 to 1.1 million by 1880. 3.4 million by 1900. Uh, Historic Brooklyn by that point had been a suburb, basically, a uh, large city in its own right. 3.4 million uh, the combined New York and Brooklyn area by 1900. 4.7 million by 1910. 5.6 million by 1920. That's a city of over 8 million people. Philadelphia goes from 674,000 in 1870 to over a million by 1890. 1.8 million by 1920, just about 2 million today. Say it's other cities, 267,000 in Baltimore in 1870, 508,000 by 1900, 733,000 by 1920. Now, it's not just uh, cities in the Northeast, the uh, uh, large industrial sec uh, cities of the North that have seen growth. You see it in the South as well. But uh, those are more confined cities like uh, Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, and uh, New Orleans. Atlanta goes from a city of 21,000 in 1870. It's been one of the largest cities in the South up to that point. That is 65,000 by 1890. Tripling in 20 years. 1920, city of 200,000. Uh, Dallas, let's go down here down towards the bottom. Doesn't exist in 1870. It's an organized city. 10,000 in 1880. 42,000 in 1900. 158,000 by 1920. By 1980, city of over a million. Houston, 9,300 in 1870, 27,000 by 1890, 138,000 by uh, 1920, but kind of growing faster than Dallas and becoming a city of over a million by the 1970s. In fact, by 1890, there are three cities in the United States of people over more than one million people in population. Chicago, New York and Philadelphia. Those three cities combined had more people in 1890 than lived in the entire country in 1790. Just those three cities. In fact, with Chicago, um, it goes from 298,000 in 1870 to over a million by 1890. 2.7 million by 1920. Made the city of over 3 million people. So Los Angeles, back in the second largest city in the United States. 5,700 people in 1870. 50,000 by 1890. Increased Ten, tenfold. Increased tenfold again, 576,000 by 1920. Cities growing very, very rapidly. That forces creates new special problems. Um, 
some cities, especially that those on the coast, uh, they're kind of blocked in by the ocean, by surrounding communities. Like I said, you've got all the plains, like, say, uh, Dallas, Oklahoma City, uh, uh, Kansas City, places like that, get it spread out. That's why in older cities, though, they have to grow. If they're going to grow, it has to be tough. So they start building larger and larger buildings. So improvements in architecture and transportation help cities grow. Uh, for example, the Home Insurance Building in Chicago, late 1885, was the first metal frame building in the United States. So they're placing these brick buildings where uh, the problem with the brick wall is the taller you build it, the more weight you're putting on the lower layers. That's the point it's so much it'll crush it unless you have thicker and thicker and thicker walls. It gets to the point the walls are so thick it's just impractical. The metal frame building takes the weight off the walls and puts it on the frame. Basically, a lighter building. Stronger, in many ways. And for along, these uh, metal frame buildings come the standard in building skyscrapers, eventually just uh, replacing a lot of the uh, these uh, buildings see today, these uh, glass and steel skyscrapers today. But of course, who wants to climb 20 or 30 flights of stairs? Sure. So in 1871, you have the electric elevator admitted, so you can go up and down uh, much easier. Skyscrapers become much more practical. But of course, God, all we're going to do, where all the people going to live, how they can get one point to another. So they start inventing, uh, the every downtown area here, electric streetcar systems. They travel from one end of the city to the other. So people start living further and further out from the center of the city. Much more, much easier to get from one point in the city to another through mass transit systems. You have the streetcar systems, but eventually after that you have uh, subways, elevated train systems. Uh, so people live further and further out. Now initially in cities, the downtown areas where all the rich, all the rich and powerful people live because it's close to uh, the financial and government centers. But streetcar systems and the other means of transportation, people start moving towards, well, start moving towards the outside of the city. Land's cheaper, they build bigger, uh, build bigger homes on cheaper land. And so as the upper classes moved out of the middle of the city, the poor started moving in because property prices started dropping. And eventually it comes just the opposite. Those living in the center of the city, those come to the slum areas. The wealthy areas are on the exterior of the city. Or have been just the opposite a few decades before. Now, of course, with these uh, far flung neighborhoods and these uh, mass transit systems, you don't have, for long have the growth of, a, of a suburbs, suburbanization. Really slow in growth after World War II. Um, better highways, uh, RP 11 cars, uh, building these large homes on the exteriors of large cities. Yeah, the, uh, these suburbs came what they called bedroom communities because they had to drive into work in the city, spend there all day, and spend all your time driving back. Basically, the only time you saw your home was at bedtime. But uh, suburbs start growing very rapidly after World War II. By 1900, most cities, and uh, large cities and medium-sized cities, uh, have electric streetcar systems with cable lines stretching above or a, a line on the rails. Low-cost, highly efficient systems. But uh, what happens, though, in the meantime, this uh, downward spiral, spiral of the uh, 
middle of the city. What's happening is unscrupulous landlords uh, took advantage of the shortage of housing that's happening in many cities and starts cramming as many people as possible into the building. What's happening is uh, you have no sanitation codes or fire codes in cities. Uh, many areas didn't even have running water. Tenants had a little redress against terrific living conditions, arbitrary rent hikes, or evictions. There's in many communities, it was simply a matter of landlords. They could get any time they wanted to. They could raise the rent any time they wanted to. Buildings are having were poorly maintained were essentially fire traps. One fire starts in one little room, the whole thing goes up in flames. You have dozens of people killed in uh, one, uh, uh, one building fire. Like I say, one perversion of this type of housing was called the dumbbell tenement. It's actually a design one in the context. Uh, it'd be a seven to eight story building designed to bring in uh, light windows for everybody, uh, maximizing use of space. You have these lots measuring about 25 feet to uh, about 100 feet. It's shaped like a dumbbell. But essentially, the way these buildings are designed was uh, you had your stairs here, you have your one bathroom here, and it's divided into four apartments. Doors here. and be a four-room apartment. Yes, it's four families sharing a bathroom, but at least you have room water. So that's already hard enough on you, but... Uh, well, there are no rules about how many people can safely live in a building. No fire codes, no fire escapes. So what happens is, more people wanting to move into these areas, so what uh, landlords start doing is they raise the rents uh, and start subdividing these apartments. Instead of uh, four families on one floor, four, one for each apartment, it's four families per apartment. Just their own little room. For each room, it would have been about... Uh, 10 feet by 10 feet, you have one family living in a 10 foot by 10 foot apartment. 10 feet be about from here to about here to about top board here to about the, uh, uh, about the second row here. There are much larger families. You got mom, dad, three, four, five kids. Let's probably have grandma or grandpa living with you too because they can't work anymore. And everyone's living in this one little room where you do all, everyone sleeps, where all the cooking's done, everything's done. You might have one though, you might not have one though. These tenements have windows or heating, which means in the middle of the winter, it's blistering uh, cold, it's horribly cold, but it's stiflingly hot in summer. You have what is now 16 families sharing one bathroom. And what's worse still, though, is sanitation's bad. One person gets sick, this whole floor gets sick. Nobody can afford a doctor. Like, so there's no um, antibiotics or anything at this point. Um, so disease are running rampant in the slums. Hospital facilities are farce at best. And a lot of city officials didn't yet recognize the difference the connection between sanitation and good health. Few government services exist to help the poor. So people under stress, little money, uh, both uh, everybody working. You have kids running the streets, having more problems, running the street gangs and so forth. A lot of violence in the homes. People under such high stress. So conditions in these slums get worse and 
dwarfs, dwarfs. Remember, still 1900, most people are, are using horses to draw wagons or drive from one place to another. Horses doing their business in the middle of the street. Typical city would produce tons of manure in a typical day. Uh, sewage systems poor at best. Uh, newspaper editor H.L. Mink once said his hometown Baltimore said, it's not like, quote, like a billion polecats. In 1892 in Chicago, there was one neighborhood that covered a third of the square mile had only three bathtubs. Three bathtubs from the entire neighborhood. People didn't bathe. There wasn't any running water. <laughs> so the excitement of the big city. We'll discuss it more next time. Chapter 21, 22 in the book.